intelligently together. Uh, and I want to particularly thank the subcommittee staff on both sides of the aisle for their tireless effort putting together this legislation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a good bill uh, that all of us can support, and I urge that we do just that and yield back. The gentleman from Kentucky yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey reserves. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I would reserve at this time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Indiana reserves. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Missouri for uh, three minutes, uh, Ms. Emerson. The gentlewoman from Missouri is recognized for three minutes. Um, I, I deeply uh, respect uh, my colleagues coming here and raising the subject of increased funds in this bill for the Corps of Engineers. And I also want to thank Mr. Freelingheisen and Mr. Visklowski for understanding this very important need. That money in construction accounts and the Mississippi and River and tributaries account will go to address uh, an immediate need to repair and rebuild flood protection so that the victims of historic flooding all up and down the Mississippi River and the Missouri River uh, can recover from the terrible losses they've suffered. It's not just the people in the southern Missouri district I represent who need help. It's also people in Louisiana and Iowa and North Dakota and Kentucky and Mississippi, Illinois and a host of other states. Throughout the country, people who rely on flood protection to shelter their homes, their schools, their churches, and their workplaces have seen their lives and their livelihoods totally disrupted. In one Missouri County alone, the economic losses from flooding are estimated at over $300 million. In the entire MR&T, the total exceeds $4 billion. Without the certainty of future repairs to the levee systems that protect them, these Americans will remain at risk. They'll be unable to rebuild. They'll find it difficult to get insurance. They'll watch their family businesses slip away with the receding floodwaters. Long after the disaster, there will be many, many personal disasters, even if it never rains another drop. I know that some of our colleagues uh, have raised concerns that this funding will come at a cost to future years of high-speed high rail development. I greatly appreciate the desire to retain the promise of funding for those projects, but I must also ask them to weigh the immediate need of fl for flood protection against the future need for high-speed rail. If these repairs aren't completed by next spring, a flood protection system that barely held against the record flood of 2011 will be in extreme danger in 2012. The Corps would not have the same tools at its disposal to avert flooding in many parts of the country, including major urban areas along the river like Mississippi, uh, like Memphis, Tennessee, just for example. The funds in this bill respond to an unanticipated disaster of enormous magnitude. Failure to fund the effort to reset the levee system nationwide is an unnecessary risk with widespread economic and public safety implications. I urge my colleagues to recognize the certainty this funding provides to distressed families all over the country, and I ask them to support a responsible arrangement to fund the Corps of Engineers during a very difficult budgetary climate for the Congress and the nation. In closing, I'm very, very grateful for the support of Chairman Freelingheisen uh, for this funding increase, and, and I yield back. The gentlewoman from Missouri yields back her time. The gentleman from New Jersey reserves. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Mr. Chair, I would uh, want to yield four minutes at this time to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, the ranking member on the Natural Resources Committee. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for four minutes. I thank, the, I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman from Indiana. You know, we continually hear from the Republicans that the pain of budget cuts has to be spread all around. Everyone has to deal with some pain. But we saw that was completely untrue in their budget plan. Uh, the GOP said, sorry, Grandma, not enough money for Medicare. Sorry, low-income kids, we can't afford Medicaid, but billions, billions in tax breaks for big oil companies, they all stay on the books. They don't even touch any of the tax breaks for big oil, for big gas, for big coal. Tax loopholes, 
that help keep companies offshoring jobs. Those were too important to cut as well. The Republican plan is about misplaced priorities. And we see it in full display here, once again today, in this bill on the House floor. When it comes to nuclear power, the Republicans want to spend more taxpayer money after Fukushima. When it comes to coal, Republicans want to spend more taxpayer money. This bill even keeps alive the deep water drilling program, ensuring that millions in tax breaks continue to be wasted on developing oil drilling technologies that rich oil companies already have and can afford to pay for themselves by tipping American consumers upside down at the pumps every time they go to refill their gas tanks. They don't need taxpayer money to do this. The last in line should be oil companies. They're first in line. They're first in line under the Republican agenda. Now, when it comes to clean energy, though, when it comes to the future, what young people think should be the future of our country, solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, clean vehicles, hybrids, plug-in vehicles, all-electric vehicles, more efficient buildings, increase in science spending for research so we make the breakthroughs in energy research, weatherizing homes and buildings. What does this budget do? Down, 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 down. They cut those budgets, every one of them. They cut the future. They cut the future. What do they do for the past? For oil, for coal, for gas, for Yucca Mountain nuclear waste dump. Up, up, up with the past. That's what this whole debate's about. It's a debate about the past versus the future. And their budget, this budget, cuts the future. It cuts it in a radical way. And it says to the young people in our country, you're going to have to wait for another generation before we see the breakthroughs in wind and solar, in all electric vehicles. That's the message to young people all across our country in this Republican uh, budget. They cut wind and solar 134 million. They cut clean vehicle technology 46 million. Green building technology 61 million. Science research 43 million. Weatherization 141 million. The list goes on and on and on. More money for technologies of the past less money for technologies of the future. I will have an amendment next week that will give us an opportunity to rectify some of these misplaced spending priorities, but I have to hand it to my Republican colleagues for one thing. They are actually being honest. May I have one additional minute? Uh, gentlemen, can I have two additional minutes? I would yield to him. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for two additional minutes. I have to hand it. I thank the gentleman. I have to hand it to my Republican colleagues. They are being honest with this bill. For the first time, unequivocally, the Republicans are telling Americans that their plan is to retreat from a clean energy future, from a solar and wind and biomass and all-electric future. They're saying it here. We want to cut all of those programs. There's no hiding behind the numbers. They're screaming out here at the members of the House on the floor, uh, to the young people of our country. They're screaming, we are going to retreat from the future. They can't talk about their all-of-the-above energy program anymore. No, ladies and gentlemen, their program is not all-of-the-above. It's oil above all. That's what it's about. That's how they keep the tax breaks. That's how they keep the subsidies for the oil industry. They cut the programs for wind and solar. Now, which industry in America is the last one right now that needs a tax break. It's the oil industry. They're recording the largest profits of any corporations in the history of America. If we're going to begin anywhere, can we begin with them? Do we have to take it out of clean energy to keep all the tax breaks, those wealthiest companies? You know who's the happiest right now? 
who's really smiling, the corners of their mouths are turned upwards all across Venezuela, all across Saudi Arabia, all across OPEC. They're looking out here at the Republican budget for the future. And they're saying, ah, we can sleep at night. We don't have to worry that there will be more efficient vehicles. We don't have to worry that they're moving to an all-electric vehicle future. We don't have to worry that they're going to tell us that they don't need our oil any more than we need their sand. No. Their message is going to be, bring it on. Let us continue to go on our hands and knees and beg for them to please produce more oil. Please sell us more oil at $100 a barrel. Please do that. That's what this Republican budget says. Vote no. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Indiana reserves. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Latham. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. I thank the chairman and uh, I thank Mr. Friedenheisen for the, uh, for the time. And Mr. Uh, chairman, I rise in support of this bill that simply to make a point about the emergency funds and the offset that's provided to the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, I think everyone is aware, but I want to emphasize the dire situation we have today on the Mississippi River and certainly in the very dire situation we have on the Missouri River today uh, that is costing lives, causing livelihoods, businesses, and the futures for so many families. Uh, we also, uh, Mr. Chairman, have a uh, dire situation with our deficit today, and we've got to address that. Uh, in order to fund the immediate repairs for the life-saving levees, the committee proposed an offset from the high-speed rail. Uh, and that's really a program that they're talking about that uh, in 10 years still uh, won't be beyond the planning phases. Uh, as the chairman of the Transportation and, and Housing Urban Development uh, Subcommittee on Appropriation, uh, I understand that uh, you know, a portion of this money would have gone to very important projects in the, in the Northeast Corridor. And uh, some of these projects have great merit, and Chairman Friedlandheisen has been the strongest advocate for funding for these projects that do have merit. He understands it. I understand it. We're going to do everything we can to fund those projects because they are needed up there. Uh, but I will also say that today we have an emergency beyond anything that I've ever seen before in my, in my years. Uh, last, uh, it would be a week ago Wednesday, uh, I was standing on a levee on the Missouri River uh, by the town of Percival, Iowa. Uh, farmers were there on the other side of the levee trying to fix uh, boils that were coming through underneath the levee, trying to save their farms, their community. Some of those farmers, it was fifth and sixth generation farms in their spots there, uh, and they were fighting desperately to, to save their, their livelihood and, and their, their family's heritage. Uh, that was 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. At 4 o'clock the next morning, Thursday morning, that levee blew out. And those livelihoods, that all those thousands of acres of farmland, uh, the town of Percival itself is now underwater. That's why these funds are desperately needed today as soon as possible to make sure that we can fund the type of emergency that we have going on today. The Army Corps of Engineers needs that money today so that they can repair those levees so that we can save lives and livelihoods and heritage uh, for, for generations to come again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this today is not about a question of what we want. We all want to see improvements in the Northeast Corridor and we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. But it's about what is needed today, what is an emergency today, what funds have to go to dire um, problems that we face and, uh, and the dire consequences we'll face if, in fact, uh, we do not do the work that we need to do today. So uh, I, expired. I commend the chairman for his great work and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Iowa yields back his time. The gentleman from New Jersey reserves. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Uh, I would inquire of the chair if you have additional speakers. Uh, at that point, then, uh, I would simply again thank the chair, the members of the committee, and the exceptional staff we have for their good work, and I would yield back my time. The gentleman from Indiana yields back his time. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield back my time. The gentleman from uh, New Jersey yields back his time.
Mr. Chairman? Gentlemen, uh, is I recognized that the committee now do rise. The question is on the motion. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union, having had under consideration H.R. 2354, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that committee has had under consideration H.R. 2354 and has come to no resolution thereon. I'm sorry. The chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Campbell of California for today. Without objection, the request is granted. Without objection, the request is granted. The chair will entertain one minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, the very notion of freedom of expression was recently on trial in the Netherlands. The popular Dutch lawmaker Gert Wilders was charged with the discrimination and incitement of hatred after he made a movie depicting Islamic clerics who incite violence in the name of religion. He was prosecuted not for his actions, but for his words. That's a scary thought. There was only one proper resolution here, and thankfully the court did the right thing. Wilders was acquitted of all charges. The court ruled that his statements might be offensive to Muslims, but fell within the bounds of political free debate. Freedom of speech is a God-given right to which every person in every nation is entitled. It is no coincidence that our country's founding fathers deemed it so important they listed it first in the Bill of Rights. A country that refuses one's freedom of speech is doomed to grow stagnant. How can it develop a society when it stifles or tries to punish opinion? As Wilder himself said, every public debate holds the prospect of enlightenment. He certainly was correct, and that's just the way it is. Are there further one-minute requests? Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is always an honor and a privilege to be here speaking on the House floor. It's interesting these days being a part of Congress. Not yet, but I need this one. Thank you. All right, thank you. The media is given unfettered access to so much because we believe that people should be entitled to the truth. In fact, um, many libraries around the country have the line, and the truth shall set you free. Of course, most people don't know where that came from. It was Jesus talking about him being the truth, and he was the truth. And uh, a lot of libraries that put that up don't realize that's what it's talking about. 
And I imagine there's a lot of reporters who have used that same line. They don't know where that came from. But what gets troubling is when reporters have access to complete transcripts, video, and they intentionally set out to deceive the public. It seems to happen a great deal. I personally think it's one of the reasons that Fox News has just taken off so strongly because people could see that the other cable news networks, so many of them at least, uh, have such a slant. They don't give you the whole truth. There's nothing fair nor balanced about some of the presentations. I know personally, having been on a CNN show where they cut your mic off for four and a half minutes, trash mouth you, mouth you for a while, turn your microphone on, and then refuse to acknowledge that there's even the possibility that what you're saying is true when you know indeed it is true. Um, but this happened just uh, here in the last week. I was on a uh, Fox Business show, and we were talking about the money being spent by this White House and also comparing that to the Bush White House. And I had the data, absolute factual data, that, um, you know, for example, in the Bush White House, there were 447 total staff. And in the Obama staff, there's 454 total White House staff. Wouldn't think seven additional people would that be that big of a deal, except that nearly a fourth of the Bush White House staff, 102 people in fact, made under $40,000. Whereas in the Obama White House, there is no paid staff member that gets less than $40,000. So you see dramatically the difference, and I was pointing out that perhaps in the uh, Obama White House, because of all the greatness of this White House as compared to prior White House staffs, that you know you deserve to be paid more because you're associated with so much more greatness in this White House. And uh, it's interesting to see over the last six and a half years I've been in Congress, there are an awful lot of people in the mainstream media especially in Washington, that do not understand sarcasm. Uh, they don't understand facetiousness. And so at times it's funny to say things sarcastic knowing that they won't get it. But um, in any event, we also commented on the fact that there were um, all these, I think, 34 czars in the Obama White House, and they're getting paid tremendous amounts of money. So the um, Fox News had published an article and they pointed these things out, talking about the interview. And they got all of the quote accurate. And they, as uh, they pointed out, it says the White House released its annual salary report to Congress. And like anything in Washington, it depends on who you ask if they went up too much or are an adequate reflection of the tough economic times and have moved down. These, this is the writing of uh, Kimberly Swant with Fox News. And Ms. White goes on to say the salaries, which can be seen here, show that about a third of the employees make more than 100000 per year, and the lowest earn 41000 except for three people who are working for no compensation or zero annual salary. 21 employees made the maximum of 172000 The White House backs the figure, saying that salaries went down an average of $150 per person, and that total salary spending decreased in part due to the total number of staffers going down as well. 
Then a quote from spokesman Eric Schultz from the White House. Uh, the President, President Obama is deeply committed to continuing to reduce costs in government. However, some critics say they're spending too much, like Representative Louis Gohmert, Republican of Texas. And they quoted me accurately, saying, in the White House, in looking at it, this administration's got over 450 employees, and now under the Bush administration, there were over 100, about a fourth of the employees made less than $40,000, unquote. Fox News fact-checked, and the congressman's statements do pan out with 102 of the 447 employees on the 2008 list having salaries of less than 40000 Another quote from me. I said, I guess you know there's so much greatness when you associate with this White House. You deserve to be paid more. I don't know, he said. Gomer added another sarcastic jab. Quote, don't forget the 34, the 34 czars that are out there dictating policy. And let's face it, when you're a dictator, you need to be paid more. Close quote. And it points out, as the economy faltered, President Obama enacted a pay freeze earlier in his administration for top wage earners. Wednesday at a Twitter town hall, he referenced the freeze. And of course, as we've learned from this White House, um, we know from the White House rule, um, the House rules, that um, the president never lies or misrepresents. But uh, certainly, there are many facts that are just wrong. Um, for example, when we were, when the president ordered our troops in to um, bomb Libya, be involved in what he called a kinetic attack in Libya, which was clearly military action. Um, he had said we would be there for days, not weeks or months. And it's turned out it's months and maybe years uh, unless Congress gets the Senate to go along with one of the things we passed here in the House to cut off the spending in a country where this president is fighting for and with a group that may turn out to be worse than the bloodthirsty, mean-spirited Gaddafi has been. Uh, in any event, there's an article written in the Hill newspaper. And again, this was fact-checked by Fox News. But it's just interesting. You hear about it all the time, the slant of the mainstream media. And it's interesting because The Hill has reporters like Molly Hooper. I've never had her be anything but completely honest and truthful. Um, she has always, that I'm aware of, been fair to me and fair in the reporting that I've seen. But this one is a person named Judy Kurtz, who, just have to say, was dishonest. This is her story that Judy Kurtz wrote this week, July 6th, in The Hill. She quoted me as saying, I guess there's just so much greatness when you're associated with this White House that you deserve to be paid more. End of quote. Representative Louis Gohmert said, quote, let's face it, when you're a dictator, you need to be paid more, unquote. Well, that gave the impression to people who read the article and that picked up on it, that I was saying President Obama was a dictator. In this setting, that is not what I said. But the, the interesting point is just how clearly deceptive and dishonest Judy Kurtz was because she took two quotes had access to the whole video, to the whole transcript, and chose to put them together and give, uh, give the wrong impression. Because when you do look at the full quote in context, we were talking about the czars, that there's so much greatness when you 
associated with this White House. You deserve to be paid more. Um, but then don't forget the 34, the 34 czars that are out there dictating policy. And let's face it, when you're a dictator, you need to be paid more. So it is important to note there are some reporters you can trust, even within the same newspaper, and there's some that can be dishonest. During my days as a trial judge, uh, major civil litigation, and felonies, including through uh, death penalty cases, a rule of evidence was always and is that credibility is always an issue. It's always an issue. And everyone should understand that, especially reporters who are so important to this country being different from any other country in the world. So it's hoped that more and more reporters will get back to deserving their protected status that they have under the Constitution and, and have a little more responsibility than Judy Kurtz did. In any event, um, it still is important. And, and I did appreciate Ms. Kurtz noting that I was being sarcastic to be sure that people like her didn't miss it. I didn't just leave it to chance. I pointed out verbally that I was being sarcastic. So I'm glad she got that part of the quote anyway. Uh, but nonetheless, I've heard from people that were shocked that I called President Obama a dictator. Now they know the context. But there are some important things going on. And with the massive overspending we're getting, it's, under, it's important to understand who's spending money where they shouldn't. We have just... Uh, voted out the defense appropriation bill today. There were a number of amendments that were voted on that would defund uh, the action this president has committed us to in Libya. This president has repeatedly said that he doesn't believe he violated the War Powers Act and doesn't believe he needed to comply. But he certainly didn't comply with the War Powers Act. He certainly didn't get approval of Congress before he took such action. Most presidents, knowing that Congress has constitutionally the power of the purse, have come to Congress, and the president has made his case to Congress as to why we should be involved in a theater of operation that the president wanted to commit us. Not this president, of course. This president heard from the Arab League. He heard from apparently some in NATO, the UN, and decided that they were more important than a consensus from Congress. Not even from the Senate. Senate is Democrat-controlled. The president didn't bother to get uh, a vote or even approval tacitly from the Senate. And here in the House, where this body, whether uh, especially as a Republican majority, has steadfastly stood with a president of any party when that president committed troops to harm's way. In this case, there are still some in, in the Republican Party who have said, I don't think we ought to be in Libya, but I'm afraid if I vote to cut off funding to the action in Libya, then it may be perceived as not being supportive of the troops. Some of us who have been in the military and still talk constantly to people in the military know the common response we get from the military goes something like this, Sir, we take orders. We salute and we follow our orders. That's what we took an oath to do. And if we're ordered to go to Libya or anywhere else, we'll salute and go. But we hope, we pray that somebody in Washington will use some good sense so that when we lay down our lives 
and the call of duty from Washington that it will not be in vain. Please take action to make sure that when we lay down our lives, it's not wasted. And for this administration and some in Congress, certainly not a majority, to think it's a good idea to go into Libya and to get our services involved in an action which um, Secretary of Defense Gates said we have no sec national security interest in that action, uh, it's not a good idea. And when we find out factually that there are Al-Qaeda, a group with whom we are at war, and there are Muslim Brotherhood who believe in violence involved in the rebel action against an evil Gaddafi, then wisdom would indicate you should find out if the person that is going to be replaced by your bombs and your military or kinetic action, you, you have an obligation to find out if they're going to be worse than the person you're replacing. And we don't know that. In fact, the indications are whoever replaces Gaddafi in this current rebel group will likely be a tremendous enemy of Israel, a significant enemy of the United States. It may be a situation in which the people that replaced an intolerant leader like Gaddafi may be worse than Gaddafi. Just as we saw happen in Iran back when Jimmy Carter was president, and as I recall, I believe Jimmy Carter welcomed the Ayatollah Khomeini back as a man of peace. Well, his, Khomeini's idea of peace was a whole lot different than most of ours, and certainly the part in Congress that's in the majority. Because Khomeini's idea of peace was a world in which there is a worldwide caliphate, and one great Muslim leader dictates what peace means. He dictates Sharia law for everyone. There is no freedom of worship for Christians, for Buddhists, for certainly not for Jewish uh, people of orthodox faith. Absolutely not. In fact, they're obviously infidels from the things that were written and the things that continue to be written and spoken in the Middle East. In Egypt, Mubarak was a problem, but Mubarak had seen the handwriting on the wall, and he was moving toward some local elections and, and could see he needed to move toward the idea of democracy, but didn't want to give up power. Mubarak, for all his flaws, at least was not active, not an active belligerent against Israel. Gaddafi, we knew had blood on his hands, but we also saw from Ronald Reagan dropping bombs down his smokestack back, I believe, in 86. And then again, when the United States moved into Iraq, we saw it again. Gaddafi was afraid of us. And perhaps it's better to have a leader who is afraid of you in power than people who are religious fanatics who have sworn that their goal in life is to bring your country down. One of the important things, and to me I think it's the most important job, Mr. Speaker, in hearing Congress, is to provide for the common defense. Now we heard the President down on the border not long ago say he's committed more uh, federal troops to our border than any president ever, more um, people down there to protect our border anyway, and actually he probably didn't have enough history training to know that in 1916, uh, President Woodrow Wilson 
not a big fan of President Wilson's, but nonetheless, after a man named Pancho Villa was responsible in coming across into the United States and killing some Americans, Wilson committed uh, General Pershing to go. My recollection, it was around 14,000 troops that went into Mexico because he had come across, Pancho Villa had come across our sovereign border and killed people. Then it was deemed to be appropriate to chase him down wherever he might go because he, that individual with his cronies had declared war on us and taken warlike action. And uh, there was also a group, a new group, basically, some called the National Guard that were called up. Uh, one account I read said over 100,000 National Guard soldiers were called to our southern border to ensure that no one came across and killed Americans again. Now, I know that President Bush committed National Guard troops, and I was very disappointed that the troops were not put on the border. They were put miles back, and they were given rules of engagement that said, it, in essence, if you see some armed group coming from across the border, then uh, you're to report it and then flee the area. Well, that's not what should have been done. And I can assure what's being done today is not what should be done, where we take more action to go against the states that are trying to defend themselves than we do to try to defend the states themselves. But we are in a crucial time in this country's history. Admiral Mullen said the national debt is the biggest threat to our security. But take your pick whether it's a nation like Iran that is led by a relig religious zealot who may be crazy, but he's not stupid. They've got people working toward, round the clock, moving toward having nuclear weaponry. They already have at least one bomb. And even though our friends down in the majority in the Senate, even though this White House, so many say, Oh, no, we just need to step up sanctions and all will be well. We'll bring them into line. Iran knows that once they've got enough in the way of nuclear weaponry, that they'll be able to extort countries into removing any type of sanctions. People in Israel are well aware, most of them, certainly Prime Minister Netanyahu is, that when Iran has adequate nuclear weaponry, there'll be a threat to Israel, there'll be a threat to freedom, there'll be a threat to liberty around the world because they will be able to take blackmail or extorted action to get countries to either do as they say or a nuclear weapon will be going off in that country. They're working on the, um, the, the missiles that will be able to carry those nuclear weapons to places like the United States. And even now, it wouldn't take a missile to put a nuclear weapon on a, on a boat, a yacht, bring it into one of our harbors. And let's face it, we saw our vulnerability on 9-11 Many of us, even though I was a judge at the time, we said we can never let ourselves be that vulnerable again. And here we are, nearly 10 full years later, and we're allowing a madman, a religious zealot in Iran, to develop nuclear weapons. Sanctions haven't worked. They're not working. The centrifuges are still turning. They're still developing nuclear weaponry. We've got um, these type of threats in the world. And instead of standing firm as Ronald Reagan did, which led to bring, bringing down the Iron Curtain, this administration has chosen to placate our enemies 
and turn against many of our allies. That was further brought home to me. I traveled with Dana Rohrbacher and a couple other members of Congress. There were warlords from the Northern Alliance of Afghanistan that wanted to meet with us because we were told that uh, the administration didn't want to meet with them. And after we met with them, it was clear why the administration wouldn't want to. Now, I was not aware, and it was during the Bush administration, of course, our initial actions in Afghanistan, we sent in intelligence, we sent in uh, special forces, we sent in weaponry, we equipped the Northern Alliance tribes who had a special personal interest in defeating the Taliban. And Afghanistan as a whole had seen how evil the Taliban was, how much damage they could do to society. As they burned paintings and books and films and totally suppressed freedom in Af Afghanistan. Well, they, they knew these people were evil, but they were afraid of them. But with the United States weaponry, with our guidance, intelligence, training, these people defeated the Taliban. What I was not aware of until we met with these folks, and turns out I, I could have been aware, I just was not, but you do the research, you find out. Uh, the Bush administration convinced the Northern Alliance Okay, now that you've whipped the Taliban, you need to totally disarm because we're the United States and we're here and we'll make sure nothing happens to you again. Well, the Northern Alliance messed up because they trusted us and they turned in their weapons. I, I asked one, you turned in all your weapons? Well, apparently they have some small arms but nothing that would allow them to take on the Taliban again. Naturally, these people were concerned because they know because they fought for and with the United States against the Taliban that if the Taliban is allowed to overtly exist in Afghanistan, then these people that fought for us and with us will all be killed as with all their family members. They were and are our allies. They fought for us. They defeated the Taliban. And now we're on the verge of leaving these people disarmed, vulnerable, and to be killed by the very people we went into Afghanistan after. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way at all. I mean, we can learn from the past. Rearm the Northern Alliance. We've, we perceive the arrogance, the condescension, not only from Prime Minister Maliki in Iraq, but, but certainly from the leader in Afghanistan, Karzai, certainly from his brother. Uh, there's just too much arrogance there. All kinds of stories about corruption, but whether or not you believe that, it's clear that the Taliban is being allowed to do things now in Afghanistan that we were supposed to have eliminated by our coming in. It may well be, as one Afghan told me, that uh, once we began, if we would, to, to rearm the Northern Alliance, Karzai might be a lot more cooperative than he has been. But nonetheless, a year ago we were being told your administration in Washington, the Obama administration, is indirectly talking, negotiating with the Taliban to just let the United States out without any big incidents and then they could have whatever they take. And that's when they pointed out you can't let this happen. You can't do this to your allies. Well, we've already seen with Israel, we voted with Israel's enemies in, in uh, May of last year, I believe it was, to demand that Israel disclose all their weaponry, their nuclear weaponry. First time the United States had joined forces with Israel's enemies. And it was one of the reasons that 
shortly after that, after we saw the flotilla come from Turkey down to challenge the Israeli blockade, that was a blockade for one thing, weapons. Prevent weapons from going into uh, the Gaza Strip. The rockets were coming every day. Israelis had been killed. There was no reason to allow those weapons to come into the Gaza Strip. It was a legitimate blockade. It came after we showed distance between our great ally Israel and this country. That also came on the heels of uh, the president snubbing Prime Minister Netanyahu. And, of course, Prime Minister Netanyahu has not spoken of this that I've ever heard or read. But certainly others noted how badly he was snubbed by the president just blow, blowing him off where normally you would have a meal saying, Good luck on your own, and when you get ready to accept what I told you to do, then send me a note, and I'll come back and see you. Um, but anyway, we have not been allies as we should be to Israel. But it was after that I started pushing to try to get Prime Minister Netanyahu, the leader of Israel, to be invited to speak in this room. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, when I broached the subject with her, thought it was a good idea but uh, she didn't feel that there was adequate time when I brought it up in June between then and the end of the year to work him in. And obviously we did have to name a lot of uh, courthouses and had athletic teams to congratulate, so we weren't able to get to that. But uh, Speaker Boehner, to his credit, um, um, did extend the invitation. Prime Minister Netanyahu did a, an incredible idea. A, a job with the ideas he put forth. He did an incredible job from the second level here of addressing this body and addressing the world from here in Congress. What I'd hoped for came to pass. The world got an incredible visual image of the fact that this body, both sides of the aisle, they can't hardly agree on much of anything over and over, I'm told 26 times, stood to applaud the leader of Israel, showing the world that we are united in our support of our friend Israel from Congress, regardless of what the House down Pennsylvania Avenue does the rest of the time. Congress controls the purse strings, and Congress is a friend of Israel, and vice versa. So it is important in order to provide for the common defense of this country that we make sure that our allies know if you're our friend, then we stand by you. If you're our enemy, then we will do, as President Kennedy pointed out, as President Bush had pointed out, we will seek you wherever you are and we will eliminate you as an enemy. By doing that, you can have peace in the world. The sign that emerges time to time, people carry around, I've seen it up here, seen it in New York, war never brought about peace, says a great deal about the history teachers that an individual who carry that kind of sign must have had. Because the only time you have peace for an extended period is when a big-hearted country does take on evil that has grown too big and become a threat to people's liberty and freedom, defeats that evil, then you have a period of peace. And the only way it becomes an extended peace is when a country is strong enough or countries are strong enough that the world knows if you become a threat to our liberty, our freedom, then we will eliminate you as a threat to freedom. Now, again, there are those who believe Sharia law talks of freedom and peace, but that's a freedom and peace as dictated by the ultimate leader of the group. Um, That also brings me back to the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
This administration has given the indication that they think it is a group of peace. You can go on Wikipedia and the proponents of the Muslim Brotherhood have done an excellent job of cleaning up the history that shows them to be supporters of terrorism and the numerous ties linking them to terrorism in the world. They've also done a good job of making this administration believe that they are peaceful and loving to the point that uh, as Dennis McDonough, the number two person in our national security agency or administration, thanked the president, Majid, Imam Majid, the president of the Islamic Society of North America, for the wonderful prayer he gave inside the White House in the celebration of Iftar last year, the end of Ramadan, that President Obama had. The Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, is a named co-conspirator, was in the Holy Land Foundation trials in which the first five defendants were found guilty of 108 counts of supporting terrorism. And when some tried to have their names stricken because they were not indicted in that first action, the judge, in essence, ruled there's been a prima facie case here showing that they are linked and supportive of terrorism. We're not eliminating their names. So it was shocking to some of us when the Holder Justice Department dropped the cases against the named co-conspirators and refused to go forward with them. This notebook has some of the materials. And there are plenty of them, as anybody can see. This, this is a thimble pool compared to what is there. You want checks from the Islamic Center's co-op fund? You want deposit slips? You want ledgers? The FBI has gathered all this stuff. There are great cases against these groups that the Holder Justice Department decided not to pursue. And when we had uh, Attorney General Holder in front of our Judiciary Committee and he was asked about dropping it, he acted like and basically stated he had nothing to do with it, that that was somebody down in Texas, attorney down there, and, and uh, he could get us a copy of the Dallas Morning News article where the U.S. Attorney, or actually was acting U.S. Attorney, had made that statement uh, that politics played no role. Well, certainly politics played a role, and that became very obvious. And the more we find, the more it appears Attorney General was not honest about um, perhaps the reason that these were not pursued. But until we find out the actual reasons for these being dropped, we will not know how honest or dishonest the situation or with this Attorney General is. I know that uh, Chairman Issa is pursuing fast and furious investigation. But on this one, we could put this whole matter to bed very quickly if the Attorney General will just produce the memorandum that Chairman Pete King and Chairman um, Lamar Smith have requested from the Justice Department. If, there, if, if he'll just come forward, produce that memo, not black it out, then we can find for sure the documentation of whether or not what the Attorney General had said in testifying before Congress was true or not. Now, it was interesting to find that the FBI had a special relationship, a special partnership with CARE, and yet another of the named co-conspirators in the Holy Land Foundation trial, and it was rather shocking to me 
that it was not until 2009 that the FBI decided to end their special relationship with this named co-conspirator in the um, Holy Land Foundation case. Apparently, the FBI had had a special relationship with CARE for years, even though the FBI began to gather these materials back as early as 1993 and had solid proof for a number of years that they were involved in supporting Hamas or terrorism, and yet nothing was was done until 2009 when a letter was sent saying because of the evidence that was introduced some months back uh, regarding care and the relationships with terrorism, we think it's appropriate to suspend our relationship for now. Now, I realize that there are people in the media, as we saw this one reporter from the Hill, that will not give ad adequate coverage, will take quotes out of context in order to misrepresent or give people a false impression. But if this is adequately looked at, and uh, even though if it's adequately looked at, people will find the truth that we have people who've been associated with support of terrorism coming to the White House, one who is president of a group who certainly from the documentation appears to have supported terrorism, leading the White House in prayer. And then we find out that when the president was giving a speech at the State Department, in the State Department, security was very, very tight. It was difficult to get in without going through all the checking and the bag checking and the metal detectors and all the different things you had to go through to make sure security was tight. Apparently, the White House invited Imam Majid, the president of the Islamic Society of North America, a named co-conspirator for supporting terrorism, he invited him into the inner sanctum of the State Department to listen to the president's speech and give comments about what he thought about the speech. At some point, this administration is going to have to get around to the point where providing for the common defense means you get tough with people who associate with groups that support terrorism. You don't do, as Senator Obama said, and just go talk to terrorists because you're so apparently warm and friendly. And really, the president, uh, having met with him, he is a charming man. He comes across as bright, engaging. You want to like him. And apparently that's worked so well he must think that he can convince religious extremists that we're good folks, so you can just get along with them. The problem is when you're dealing with people who want to destroy your way of life, there's only one way to deal with them. We've seen from the attacks in the early days of our country's existence from Islamic zealots in North Africa who captured our ships, took prisoners, the men on those ships, held them for ransom, used some as slaves, willing to kill or enslave others. And I read at one point, uh, and it's hard to believe that this is true, hopefully it's not, but that at one point, we may have paid as much as 18% of the country's budget back in the late 1790s for um, getting our sailors back from the Barbary pilots, these Islamic extremists. Thomas Jefferson, who had been sent at one point as one of the diplomats to negotiate with the Muslim extremists, was 
taken aback that when he asked, why would you attack American ships? We're no threat to you. We don't have a powerful Navy. We've never attacked you. What? And uh, reportedly was told that we, in our religion, believe we go to paradise if we were to die while attacking infidels like you. Jefferson was shocked. He was, he was an extremely well-read person. He found it hard to believe there was a religion anywhere that, that any believer of that religion perceived that you could go to a paradise by killing innocent people. So he got his own English translation of the Quran that can still be found in the Library of Congress so he could read for himself. Some of the uh, passages are subject to interpretation and certainly have been interpreted by some uh, as meaning the on only way to proceed is to attempt to take out infidels like um, those of us who are Christians, those of us, uh, those who are Jewish, uh, because we are certainly considered infidels in their eyes. Thank goodness not all Muslims believe that that has to be what occurs, but that is certainly what some believe. Uh, Anyway, I, I might read a passage from the judge's decision from July 1st, uh, 2009, in response to the um, effort by the named co-conspirators, some of them, to have names stricken who were not actually indicted in the first trial. But uh, the judge, having reviewed uh, acting Attorney General, uh, acting U.S. Attorney. Jack's uh, memos, he said this, the government has produced ample evidence to establish the associations of CARE, ISNA, and NAIT with the Holy Land Foundation, HLF, the Islamic Association for Palestine, and with Hamas. While the court recognizes that the evidence produced by the government largely predates the Holy Land Foundation designation date, the evidence is nonetheless sufficient to show the association of these entities with the Holy Land Foundation, HLF, IAP, and Hamas. The judge said, thus maintaining the names of the entities on the list is appropriate in light of the evidence proffered by the government. It's important to note, care with whom our Justice Department had a special relationship until on into 2009. ISNA, that the evidence has certainly been produced by the government, shows, as the judge says, ample evidence to establish the associations with these groups, uh, with the Holy Land Foundation, the group that was convicted, as well as you know Hamas, and yet this administration continues, I guess, to think that their winning personalities, charming as they are, will bring people around. And so they trust them to come into the inner sanctum of the White House, the State Department, Justice Department, and all that means is we're in big trouble. Well... There are those over the years that have uh, believed that our answers would come from prayer. Virtually every president, I guess every president, has indicated such that this nation is best protected when it prays. And that is why you would have such a, an amazing minister as Peter Marshall, as chaplain in the United States Senate back in the 1940s. And this book that I've referenced previously is really profound. And I, I would, Mr. Speaker, like to finish up reading a couple of prayers that have been prayed in the United States Senate in the 1940s. 
by chap U.S. Senate Chaplain Peter Marshall. One prayer says, Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for doing the things that make us uncomfortable and guilty when we pray. We say that we believe in God, yet we doubt God's promises. We say that in God we trust, which can be found right up above the speaker's head. Yet we worry and try to manage our own affairs. We say that we love thee, O Lord, and yet do not obey thee. We believe that thou hast the answers to all our problems, and yet we do not consult thee. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of faith and the willful pride that ignores the way, the truth, and the life. Wilt thou reach down and change the gears within us that we may go forward with thee? Amen. And that was Peter Marshall's prayer. One of his prayers as chaplain of the Senate in the 1940s. I conclude with this prayer by Peter Marshall in the 1940s. He said, O Lord our God, even at this moment, as we come blundering into thy presence in prayer, we are haunted by memories of duties unperformed, promptings disobeyed, and beckonings ignored. Opportunities to be kind knocked on the door of our hearts and went weeping away. We are ashamed, O Lord, and tired of failure. If thou art drawing close to us now, come nearer still, till selfishness is burned out within us and our wills lose their weakness in union with thine own. Amen. It is important to note prayers for the individuals to adhere, as George Washington said, uh, to have an humble imitation of the designer of our blessed religion, as Washington said. Those are for individuals. But we get questions on, well, how can you be a Christian and not want to give away all the government money to the poor and the needy? How can you be a Christian and not want to give away the government money to do all these other things and to end a defense department, have no soldiers, just be people of peace? And I know that in this great country, we've got virtually every religion being practiced that's known to man. But in the Christian religion, for those that believe the New Testament means what it says, Romans 13 is very clear. You know, the government exists as God's minister so that they encourage good. And Romans 13, 4 says, But if you do evil, be afraid. God does not give the government the sword in vain. And it does say sword. And that is the purpose of government. We took an oath to follow the Constitution. We're supposed to provide for the common defense. We're supposed to have an army, a military that protects this nation so that people can practice the religion of their choice, whether it's Islam peaceably, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, human secularism, it seems to have often overtaken Washington. You have the freedom to do that. But the government's role is to protect the country, protect the people, keep people from coming in through our borders that want to harm us so that individuals can give from the blessings of their heart to help the needy, to help the poor, to help others. You cannot find one reference in the, in the New Testament that says government is to go about using and abusing its taxing authority, legalize stealing from people who have earned the money so that we can give it away to Congress's favorite charity or a government's favorite charity. The government's to provide protection, protect against evil, encourage good, and create an environment where good people can do good. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back.